If you thought this video was going to be about making fun of dudes who listen to video game music, well you're wrong. Because I am him. I admit it. Because next to how it plays, one of the most important characteristics of a game is how it sounds. I find the process of making music for video games a lot more interesting because it's not always about just making something that sounds good or even following a certain direction for sound. A composer's job is not an easy one. What, you're telling me I gotta make a fitting soundtrack for this? And it's gotta be 15 tracks long? And it's gotta be fucking fire? Break them all! But the most important consideration is does it fit with what I'm seeing on the screen? One of the most unnecessarily heated debates in video games with the Doom franchise. After Doom's revival in 2016, the franchise saw a major gameplay shift, which many people enjoyed, but a lot of purists did not. Fans of New Doom to this day are still being portrayed as soy-facing Redditors. Newer Doom games revolve around more fast-paced gameplay, where quick strategic movement and weapon management are required. You are quite literally ripping demons apart in a bloody, gory mess, and the music has changed to reflect this. The soundtrack is now high-tempo heavy metal, or the correct term, Degent, composed by the talented Mick Gordon. Now this style is perfectly fitting for the gameplay. You feel insane when in the heat of the battle, swinging around like a fucking spider monkey, avoiding enemy fire, switching through 15 guns in 3 seconds. You feel cracked at the game, even if you're getting your ass kicked. You feel as powerful as Doom Guy himself, even though you're a fat ass loser from Ohio. Now Doom 1 and 2 soundtrack are much different. These songs are fucking iconic, they capture what the original Doom is all about. Boomer bait. I mean, it's hard to refute that when some of the tracks are literally MIDI versions of Slayer and Pantera songs. But getting real, Doom 1 and 2 share similar fast-paced run-and-gun combat, but are more level-centric and feel more streamlined. Unlike New Doom, which feels more like a spectacle with its environments and flashy combat. There's no lore shoved in your face. These are games you can replay levels, going for higher score and finding secrets. Since these games combine combat with exploration instead of New Doom's formula of exploration with combat sections sprinkled in, having a badass looping metal track, it just works. What about Doom 64's music? I would uh, rather not talk about that one. So as we see, a good soundtrack fits the game it's in, and it's enjoyable on its own, right? Well, of course, but let's be real. It doesn't matter how well Beverly Hill Cop on PC's theme fits when it causes actual pain to listen to. Bad video game music has the tendency to make a larger impact, because if I'm going to listen to something for potentially minutes on end, then it better at least be tolerable, or I'm turning that shit off and I'm putting on some Floyd. There are songs that are intentionally bad, like the pizza delivery theme from Spider-Man 2, or Keeping with Spidey, the Funhouse theme from Spider-Man on Genesis that makes me feel like I'm off the goblin gas. But that was the intention. As a composer, whatever you do, under any circumstance, you cannot fuck up the music, because the next game's soundtrack was so ass that it permanently damaged the reputation of the game itself, and that game is Yoshi's New Island. Dear God. Out of all the instruments they could have chosen to primarily feature, Kazoo? The children's toy they give out to kids who didn't bite their dentist's finger. This one song was most people's only exposure to the game, and it has set a bad taste in the collective community of people who didn't play its mouth. But it does not stop there. The whole soundtrack is composed of awful kazoo harmonies and songs so short man? and repetitive that the Nokia ringtone library has more variety. I get the vibe they were going for, a childhood innocence type beat. So the music is generally softer and uses a lot of instruments that kids would play, like recorders and xylophones and kazoos. But I gotta ask myself, when is stylization going too far? If it actually ruins some of the enjoyment of the associated game, should we really be pushing this cutesy art style anymore? That seems to be the problem with many of the Yoshi games, especially in Crafted World where the soundtrack is somehow worse than New Island. That's the main theme. This game's soundtrack sounds like nursery rhymes to me. It's maddening.
And actually, when I listen to some random tracks from both games, they have a leitmotif, a uh, recurring melody, which there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I find it quite cute when games do that. But in these games, it's like in every song. A few times, well, that's okay, but every song? Shit's gonna be eating at your sanity like a brain-eating amoeba. You're gonna be writing the notation on the walls of your insane asylum, bro. I'd become the Joker playing this. I have not played New Island or Crafted World, but the general consensus is that... They're mid. And hey, if they were going for the worst gaming experience of all time, they pretty much nailed it with the shitty music amplified by the mid gameplay. And that brings us to Immersion. Every good game wants the player to feel a part of the world somehow, and unfortunately that leaves a lot of games sounding like this. Need to find that gun. Man, it's really disappointing to play a newer game and hear nothing, or if there is music it sounds like a generic Marvel movie score. AAA game devs are seemingly trying to bridge the gap between game and movie because to them, the average consumer looks like this. But yes, technically it does fit the theme of Grand Adventure, and I won't lie, some of these games still have other great tracks in them, but it just makes the world feel even emptier in an era where the term open world is almost always a death sentence. If only there was a game soundtrack that was able to have engaging and memorable level themes while also remaining atmospheric. Hmm. Consider the following. Metroid Prime. Metroid Prime is a very lonely game. There's no humans, no codec calls, no journal logs, no nothing. Samus doesn't even pull the protagonist trope of talking to herself like, Hmm, better go upgrade my suit if I want to get through there. Nope, it's just you and your own company in an isolated, foreign planet. Fendera Drifts, a desolate, frozen over world of pure ice, has this beautiful piano soundtrack to accompany it. Man, you know, this track sounds like that one time my mom forgot to pick me up from school, and I had to stay there until 5 p.m. Then you have something like Magmore Cavern. It's the planet's on fucking fire! There's always a sense of danger, one wrong step, and your ass is going in lava. This area relies more on skill and progression. You aren't going to be sightseeing in here, so the music changes to reflect that. Man, Nintendo was really cooking with this franchise and they threw it all away to make baby games for a decade. They really had their own Halo there for a minute. Wait a minute, Halo! Halo is far less generous with its music. A lot of the game is played in ambience, but that just makes the moments where the music does kick in some of the most keno moments in gaming history. Just take Halo 3's first mission. You start off falling from space and burning up in the atmosphere. Sergeant Johnson's all like, ah, this fuck is dead. No, he's very much alive. This sets up the tone for the series pretty well. Badass, but elegant, and that's how I would describe the music. From the same mission, you get the song Another Walk. The previous Halo games had their own walk theme too, but this one just feels right in the context of the Tanzania jungle. I would go into detail of all the great songs in the Halo franchise, but it's something that needs to be experienced firsthand. Listen to them at your own leisure, but doing that without playing the game is like using the Halo 2 Magnum. What are you, fucking stupid? Nobody nails game soundtracks more than Rockstar. Not only do their games have some of the most fitting soundtracks, but they have some of the best soundtracks in gaming, period. And you have Red Dead, Western music, Bully, 70 sounding beach rock, LA Noir. Jazz. You fuck young boys. The GTA 4 DLC The Ballad of Gay Tony lives up to the name by quite possibly having the gayest sounding theme song ever. I know I've said this before, but it's important. These soundtracks make you feel attached to the world they portray. In Red Dead, there are scripted moments where songs will play in certain situations. After you finish off the last of the Vanderlyn gang, you're finally able to go home to see your wife and kid in humanized tumor that is Uncle. The ride back is accompanied by the song Compass by Jamie Liddell. 
This is one of the most emotional moments in the game for me and all you do is ride a damn horse. Again, even as a fat ass loser from Ohio, I empathize with John. I feel a tremendous weight being taken off of my shoulders. It's rewarding and for a second you feel a shred of hope that everything is going to be okay. Except you already know that's not true. I've talked about how a good soundtrack can make a great game even better, but what about the contrary? Can a good soundtrack make a bad game better? Yes. This happens a lot more often than you can think. Castlevania 64, bad game, great soundtrack. Glover, terrible game, soundtrack could be labeled as a modern day Digicore album. Crash Twin Sanity, a completely broken and unfinished Crash game that has one of the most unique OSTs of any game. A completely acapella soundtrack done by the band Spiral Mouth. But the crowning victor of bad games with great soundtracks goes to Sonic the Hedgehog. I have tried time and time again to get into Sonic, but any game where this fucker isn't in two dimensions, it just feels like work. Even the quote unquote best of 3D Sonic. Watch out! You're gonna crash! Ah! I, I, I just, I just can't take this shit no more, man. But there is one thing I can always take away from a Sonic game, and that is a godly soundtrack. Sega does not mess around in regards to music. Every Sonic game has that one song where even the strongest Sonic hater has to admit, okay, yeah, that, that's pretty good. His World from Sonic 06, Fist Bump from Sonic Forces, these songs have the ability to make me lose all self-awareness and gain the mentality of an autistic 5th grader. Or more accurately, an autistic 35 year old man. A big contributor of Sonic's catalog of amazing music is the band Crush 40, who've done songs for basically every 3D Sonic game from the 2000s, including Shadow the Hedgehog. And they made the smartest move ever by giving the edgiest video game character of all time the edgiest type of music of all time. Butt rock ass new metal. Oh my God. Yeah. Even the spin off games have great music. Just look at Sonic R. Now, without music, this game is a hate crime. How could you make a Sonic racing game clunky dog shit? But play it with the music and. Sonic Speed! The second crowning victor of bad games with great music goes to the NES. Yep, just the NES, the whole oh thing. Oh my god. Let's be real, like 90% of the NES library is aged like your parents 10 year old bottle of Thousand Island dressing that they refuse to throw away. Chalk it up to age and the fact that developers had to make games bullshit hard on purpose. The one thing that a lot of mediocre NES games have in common is a great soundtrack. And the savior of many shitty games from this era is the man Tim Fallon. This guy is nothing short of a genius and I mean it. He has abused and violated the NES sound chip so hard that I am surprised he dodged allegations. It's like how Seth MacFarlane has a singing voice that could rival Sinatra and he uses it on the funny family dog. If you look at his discography, you can see he's credited to nothing but bad to mediocre games, and one of them is Solstice. The menu music for this game actually starts off sounding really... bad. And then out of nowhere, BOOM! Tim Fallon casts the most evil wizard shit you ever heard in your life. Seriously, the menu music from Solstice is great. It's really dynamic too. There's a surprising amount of tempo and time signature changes throughout the song's three minute length. Silver Surfer, regarded as one of the hardest and most unfair games on the NES. You feel more like the Silver Spooner with how much your ass gets played with in this game. For a game that's unnecessarily hard with no real reward, you gotta have something that's enticing. And that would be its kick-ass soundtrack. And if you still aren't convinced at the sheer technical power of this man, go listen to the music he made for Pictionary. Family game that will never be the same, kids. We on some Blade Runner 25th anniversary director's cut type shit. As you can see, video game music can be surprisingly technical. 
What some composers do to make the experience even more immersive is creating an adaptive soundtrack. The song will be changed on the fly to a different rendition or new instruments will be added to the mix. This is done in response to what's happening in-game. Say you go underwater and the track becomes more peaceful, or you're on low health and the track becomes distorted to invoke panic, and an urge to find health because the sound is really annoying. The best application of dynamic music in my eyes is when it's done solely to make the player feel cool. Metal Gear Rising is probably the best example. Kojima once again flips the gaming industry on its head and proposes the question, what if video game music had lyrics? After you get to a certain point in the game's boss fights, lyrics will start to accompany the track. The people who say Kojima should just make movies they might be onto something though, because this makes for some of the most cinematic fights in the franchise and even gaming history. And while adaptive soundtracks are complex and require a lot of work, there is a game that goes absolutely feral with that concept. The game with the most complex soundtrack of all time is Pikmin 2. Pikmin 2 has dynamic music, but it isn't just two or three different renditions of a track. It is much more. Let's start with the area themes. There are four areas in the game, each of which has six different mixes. When an enemy is near, during combat, doing task, carrying treasure, near an ultra spicy plant, and during sunset. So right, that's four areas multiplied by six mixes. We got 24 different compositions. All right, now take in the fact that swapping to the other captain, Louie, causes the music to follow a different rhythm. So actually, that's 48 compositions. But we have the other factors such as having low health or taking damage, or when you have less than 10 Pikmin on the field. Doing the math, we now have 384 different compositions. Oh, but we're just getting started. The main gameplay gimmick of Pikmin 2 is the cave system. Most of your time is going to be spent in here, so there's many different tracks that play during caves. In total, there are 23 different tracks with 5 different variations. So right there, we already have 115 compositions. Now we have to factor in Louie, taking damage and having less than 10 Pikmin. Doing the math and adding the area themes, there are about 1,304 songs in Pikmin 2. And that's not even counting boss music. But the math doesn't even matter because each floor of the caves are actually randomly generated. So much like how no one cave is going to be the same, the music won't be either. Because that is also randomly generated. Yes, my rotted brain tried its hardest to understand this, but from what I get, Pikmin 2 uses a system where each layer of the music, i.e. percussion, bass, synths, is made into a bunch of different melodies that get randomly strung together. These all come together during gameplay and somehow the music still sounds good. So in reality, there are like 10 million songs in Pikmin 2. What the fuck? Honestly, I don't like listening to game soundtracks because it makes me feel like I haven't mentally grown since the age of 11, but god damn it, I can't help it. I will continue to hide this fact like I'm hiding the most depraved porn you could imagine probably for the rest of my life. But I know I'm not alone, and honestly sometimes you just gotta sit back and enjoy a good soundtrack from one of your favorite games. Even if it's something as universally loved like Halo, or something as autistic as Wild Woody on Sega CD. At the end of the day, one thing remains true. If you listen to the Minecraft soundtrack, you have no sauce.